It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. <laughs> I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Hi, guys. Welcome to Bigfoot Collectors Club. I'm your host, Michael McMillan, and with me always is your other host, Bryce Johnson. Hi, Bryce. How's it going? Uh, so this is the podcast where we share cool stories from paranormal history and interview celebrity guests about their own strange encounters. This is episode 11, part four of our Crazy Ex-Girlfriend Month. I play Tim on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and every week this month we have a different employee from the White Feather and Associates Law Offices. So cool. With us this week, you guys are in for a real treat, because she's coming in loaded. <laughs> uh, she plays Paula on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and you can see her in the film Downsizing, and she is a star of the Broadway stage as well. Please welcome Donna Lynn Champlin. Wow. Hi. Hi, That's so hi. I'm so excited to have you on the show because uh, out of all the guests we've had so far, I think you might be the most experienced when it comes to the paranormal. I would put money on it. I would wow. put a lot of money on that. Great. Yeah. I just made a lot of money. Yeah. I bet Riley. <laughs> $2,000. You're screwed, Riley. I know. I heard about you. I'm very excited. Oh, I see. My reputation proceeds. Yeah. So what... Is your personal paranormal history, Donna? Well, ever Donna since Lynn. I was a Do you prefer small... Donna Lynn or Donna? I always I call you Donna. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. DL. I don't have a preference. Okay, cool. Um, it started when I was very, very small. And I was, of course, I was raised Irish Catholic. But I always had an affinity for the occult from a very, very early age. I remember we went to the public library and I would sneak, like I would be going to the porn section, you know, Ooh, but then yeah. I would go to the occult section. And wow. Have I, you checked out the porn section? I love that too? it's I love <laughs> that the it, public library. Yeah, it has I a love pretty good it it's porn. It's extensive. <laughs> That's the same for me. Porn and then ancient mysteries. Right yep. the it's top. all the same. Where there you go. Yeah. Um, and you grew up where? I grew up in Rochester, New York. Okay. Um, and a very Irish Catholic family. And uh, I remember I found a book of spells, but it was white magic. And so my mom... I kind of snowed her. And so like, I. Mom, it's, it encourages me to grow herbs in the garden. It's saints. It was all saints. <laughs> oh. That's how I got away with it. Amazing. And um, I, so I started practicing at the tender age of like five or six. And, um, not really knowing what I was doing. And then I've always had a, an affinity for Halloween, and I've always had an affinity for ghosts, the paranormal, um, aliens, all that stuff. And, um, when I was older and I moved to New York, I got hooked up with a metaphysician and I became her apprentice. Oh, wow. And we opened up a reflexology shop where we did a lot of witchy stuff, good witchy stuff. Yeah. Um, but because of my experience with um, Judy Wicker, uh, I have been uh, an apprentice and an assistant on quite a few paranormal experiences. And then, you know, you work in the theater, you work regionally, you know, you get put into these old houses, you know, that were built in the 1800s and there's tons of stuff going on in there. So the theater is constantly just ghosts everywhere. If, you right. know, if you're paying attention. And for our listeners, who is Judy Wicker? Judy Wicker was the metaphysician that I worked gotcha. with in New York. And, um, she's legendary within certain circles and uh, yeah, and so I worked with her, and I learned reflexology, terology, numerology. Um, I would go get her herbs. Well, I, mean, I love that because it's actually applied science towards like the science of mind. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you know the whole idea of what you put out, you get back tenfold, and you know that's karma. That's the golden rule. That's flow. everything. Yeah, and we As studied above, so not only the occult, but we studied um, all different religions. Um, so it was just a really fantastic sort of break in my um, performing career. I had no clue that you were that into, I mean, I... Well, you don't, and I had I, a company called Tarology too, where I would, where I read tarot cards why and tarot not, diaries. I've and... known you for two years. <laughs> this is the first time we're really taught. I mean, I knew about the Halloween thing. Well, because and, we're and, always at work, or well, we're always with my son, who's six, and so, like, it's hard to kind of, like, This is why into... we started this podcast. Exactly. <laughs> but that's a huge part of my life. Huge. I, I thought you had just been on some ghost hunting oh, expeditions. No, I was a member of the New York Ghost Chapter. That's, but, you told me that. Yeah, okay, but the so thing what, is... Okay, so what's that? What's that? Okay. Okay, well, it's a, unfortunately, I don't know much about it because they, of course, did all their expeditions at night and I worked in the theater and mm -hmm. I worked at night. So mm -hmm. after a while, they were like, you can never come. Right. So, and I was like, yeah, good You're point. Like, schedule like, something for Monday nights. <laughs> exactly. Sunday nights, Monday hunts. nights, I'll be there. 
Um, but I have, like, I also love whenever I go to a new city. I mean, I studied in Oxford and I, New Orleans, obviously, is a fantastic place. I will try and um, hook up with some sort of, I mean, they do always have those ghost tours. But if you know what you're looking for, you can find kind of more of an official part of an ongoing um investigation mm-hmm. with maybe a paranormal unit in the local college, you know, something that's a little more um, in, in, invested in not somebody. Not so who, touristy. Not so touristy. Sure. I you know, that. the nuts and bolts of, it's a great ghost story, but I want to go in with an EVP. I want to go in with divining rods. I want to, you know. How yeah. does your uh, ghost hunting uh, work intersect with the more traditional, uh, not uh, would you call it Wiccan? What would you call? I am a Wiccan. Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah. how do, how do those two in the Venn diagram? What's the intersection there? Uh, as far as Wiccan and what community uh, and ghost hunting, like oh well, I mean, because uh, I wouldn't way, necessarily I mean, put Wic- them together. No, Wiccan is more of a. I mean, like any religion, it's a yeah. it's a way of living. It's a it's a way to make sense of the world that makes you a better person. And a philosophy. From, it's a philosophy, and you know the ghost hunting is. It, I don't. I think that that Venn diagram goes across all religions. Christians believe in ghosts. Judaism. I mean, everybody believes in an afterlife. Mm-hmm. So I don't think the ghost stuff really has much to do with being Wiccan as ghost being part of a human experience that right. we all have right. a curiosity So you're about. just a Wiccan who happens to be into ghosts as well. Yeah, right. but I think being I think Wiccan that's... lends itself to a more Well, that's my question. Spiritual... So what tools, how you're do tools... you a truth seeker. Well, as far as being Wiccan, we know we, we're very much about the... Um, the veil and when it's thinnest and when it's thickest and solstice and Beltane and Samhain and it's all about it's all about the rhythms of the earth and the rhythms of the the world the planet and um, so the science behind that is there are certain times of year and there are certain days where those things are heightened like for instance you know it's based on the Druid calendar mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. philosophy and so a lot of that stuff like I went to Stonehenge. Um, I went to a lot of great kind of kind of chalk circles when I was in school in England. And, you know, the science behind that is that, you know, some people believe it's a calendar. There's because at certain times of the year, religiously, <laughs> ritualistically, the sun will come up, you know, behind a certain stone. And then six months later, the sun will set behind a certain stone. And so also considering that the, you know the wiccan belief of the power of the earth that's also you know transverse lines of energy and so there are hot spots obviously stonehenge is a hot spot Arizona, sedona is a hot spot yeah. and these are places where uh, you know, the energy lines of the earth intersect and cross and become more powerful. The ley lines? Yeah. The ley lines. No, this vibes with all the stuff we talk about. Yeah. So I think certainly Wiccans are more open to the fact that it's not so much woo-woo, but more actual applicable science, sure. geological science, whereas Christians, me having sort of experienced both sides, Christians are a bit more scared and a bit more wary and a bit more, oh, it's out of my control. But that was just bad branding. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like that that that, 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 that was They're working that, on it. That was a result of an act of an active campaign by the church to be like, don't believe in this pagan well, stuff. Well, you know, God while, bless the while, church, while but they took co-opting all the, all exactly, the good it stuff took for all the pagan, Took all the pagan that. holidays. Here's all the all of our myths come from like there's so much stuff that comes from Egypt and Osiris when yeah, it comes to right. Jesus. Yeah. And then all the Christian traditions come Christmas, from Easter, the, Dru- yeah. the well, Druids know, and, had, and the Nords. I mm-hmm. just had this conversation. I have a six-year-old, and you are, you you oftentimes find yourself at a uh, at a crossroads because here you are, you know, you're you're working these wonderful pagan holidays like yeah. Santa Claus and all these Easter bunnies, and then you're trying to discuss with them the greater truths, like who are we, where do we come from, like yeah. where are we going, you well, know? We've and had it, a lot of deaths in my family too, and that's a really interesting thing to try and explain to a child. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, those are those are big questions, you know. Um, yeah, I forgot uh, what my. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> you so, you know, no. We're talk- now we're talking about dead family members. Oh, I'm sorry. Kind I brought really... down the whole damn oh, room. My... I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> no, but I, I remember my point. I was going to say it's it's no wonder so many people can become confused, or it actually empowered me to 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 um to really f- ask the big questions. You know what I mean? Because. You know, when you tell a kid this is real and then this is not, or this is real and you're not supposed to believe that, it can all be so confusing, you know? Extremely. 
Um, but that's why we have to ask these great questions. And, and you know, I, I love that we all do that, you know? Well, I, yeah, I had a question. My, my son is sort of asking about religions. My husband's Jewish and I'm Wiccan. And, you know, so it, it's this very question of, of, you know, why are there different religions? And, you know, I, I just pretty much land on the whole, you know, each one has a set of rules. They all have the same rule, though, which is do unto others. Every mm -hmm. single religion has that. The golden rule, sure. And, you know, that's basically, you know, for now, let's focus on that. Right. Yeah. We, right. And then if you want to, you, <laughs> you, you find your, yeah, your, your own avenue as you get older. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we, we tend to, we, so we've covered ghosts a little bit and I know you have, uh, something for us. Uh, I do. And then, uh, what about, where do you come to, where's your mind set at with things like Bigfoot and extraterrestrials? I believe it all. Yeah. I think it's insane to not believe it. I think it's arrogant and egotistical to not at least entertain the possibility. You know, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not going out of my way to prove it. Right. I, I'm just, uh, we I'm, are. Oh, I know. <laughs> we <laughs> literally have fight. a show about it. Fight the so good fight. I, if, you need, if you need a platform, this is it. I'm on board because, you know, for me especially, again, it's it's a way of thinking that makes me a better person. I mean, I grew up again Irish Catholic, and I was not as good of a person, I don't think, as I am now as a Wiccan and as someone who believes that all these things are possible. So, um, yeah, I'm down for it all. I think I think it all it's all real. It all makes sense to me. It, awesome. It, we all live on such a, a, a mystifying planet. I, 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 having a wonder about it gives me like gives me hope. It gets me excited. It, well, like, I, you know, the mystery is so much fun. I need a little bit of this in my life. Otherwise, I would get depressed. Yeah, for sure. You know sure. what I mean? Especially, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I was... Last episode, I was kind of kicking around. We were talking a little bit why... Why now? Why this podcast now? Like, I'm sort of, sort of having this sort of existential moment with this show. And, I mean, look at what's going on in the world right now. Look at what's happening in this country with the politics and everything. And it's not escape necessarily, but it. I think this stuff becomes a tool to teach your brain to look at things a little bit differently and with an open mind and with imagination. Yeah. Well, and to avoid the cacophony of chaos. The cacophony? <laughs> yeah. Are you sure it's not the cacophony? Well, that too, but surrounding headlines and stories and popular culture. I put myself in a bubble lately. Yeah. I, don't, I don't watch the news. I don't get it's online. Hard. And because I just want to, you My, know. Judy used to say, you know, you have to be careful what you watch with you. You can poison yourself through your eyes oh, as well. God. It's she a poisoning to, time right yeah, now. Yeah, she was Absolutely. like, you can't unsee stuff. You have to remember that you can't unhear and you can't unsee stuff. So yeah. be really, really careful. I'm currently off social media with the exception of the podcast, just primarily to avoid the Last Jedi spoilers. Right. We're recording right. this the days before it comes out. <laughs> but I got to tell you, even in the past 24 hours, the fact I'm not like constantly checking in with my facebook or instagram just just out of sheer boredom mm -hmm. like it's this healthier. this thing to you know we should have quiet moments sitting alone oh, think God, about I when you were a child you had so many moments where you just <laughs> sat alone and you were bored well or i you... left facebook completely yeah that, that was after the first year i left it completely uh, but i also just randomly today i was doing my laundry and i forgot my phone and so i was sitting in the laundry room singing christmas carols and i thought <laughs> i never would have done this this is awesome That's wild. yeah listen i want our listeners to find us on Facebook because we do share really cool photos about this, but I'm realizing it's for me, it's way better as a tool to prop this show and to share the photos that we talk about on the show. Oh, it's and a great it is, company. But yeah, I've, I've really been checking out personally on what's going on there. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so Donna Lynn, yes. you have something that you brought for us today. I do. So what's this? What's okay. the story? So when I was in New Orleans, um, I w w hooked up with this ex ongoing ghost expedition. And it was crazy because <laughs> I didn't realize how official it was until I kind of showed up. So anyway, so I go and there's this huge, well, like 30 of us, there's a huge bus. They tell us to get on the bus. We're like, Rrr. so we drive to this dead part of town. And it was, was it right before Katrina? It was, it was, there was no electricity. There was no grid. There was nothing. There was a cop that came and, I mean, because it was just desolate. And so they said, okay, everybody, here's a bunch of, EV, there, here's a bunch of, uh, you know, di uh, divining rods and EVP. What are those, the thing that, well, what we all had, you know, our personal cameras and our personal mm -hmm, sure. whatever. The electronic. Uh, the electro and I had a little electronic recorder, digital um, recorder. And for is the, it EMP meters? Oh, not well, EMP, EVP meters. What's is the one what's voice the thing phenomenon? Right. with the captures. energy? What's the one with oh, the. Oh, uh, the, the, those little uh, meters that I know. It's like, it's like what Egon walked right, exactly. around with. Those things. Yeah. 
Yeah. So they had a pile of those Except and they said different. everybody grab, you know, and they said just a heads up, any of you with cameras or digital recorders, your batteries are going to die. So you might as well take this. And we have done some, put tons of extra batteries and blah, blah, blah. So we were put in a group of, I think, five or six. My group happened to be all women. And all they did was they were like, we're not going to tell you anything. We want you to go into it was a three hour thing for the first two hours. A three hour, hour tour. tour. Sorry. And they they said stick with your group, um, a, mostly for safety. And then you have of course had to sign an agreement that was like you know if anything happens to me I don't I won't sue you, which I sign a lot at the Eastern <laughs> State Penitentiary. I find everywhere I go I'm sending these. Yeah, sure, sign my life away. So. I was very, so we went through the whole thing, two hours, you went in all these different rooms, very decrepit, very weird. I'm an empath, much to my own disappointment, um, because uh, I would love to hear voices and see things, but I just don't. So I went with this group, and I took pictures dutifully, I turned my digital thing on, I did the whatevers, and I didn't think anything of it, I was so pissed. And Donna, where is this? This is in a penitentiary? No, this is just um, a, this a, ghost, a house, part, old ghost, house, ghost town, ghost house. a hundred year old house, a, old, in a house. desolate neighborhood with no grid. In New Great. Orleans. Great. And um, no R- parallel. Real quick, nothing. before you go on, you said you're an empath, but you don't hear voices or so, so what do you, what, an, what is that, an yeah. audiopath? Or oh, okay, so an empath, you sense you the feel. emotions. So you walk in a room and you feel, you get an over overwhelming feeling of sadness or euphoria or fear you can or pick up the energy you feel you feel and it's 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 I it's I for me it's the most unexciting of the psychic powers, but there that's the one I have. And um, I mean, hey, you won actor, the psychic lottery. You got some psychic powers. <laughs> yeah, really. I, I, Quit your bitching. Everyone has psychic powers. Y'all don't realize which ones you have yet, though. Um, so we go through the whole thing. I'm so upset because everybody in my group has had an experience. They felt a pinch. They felt this. They felt that. They heard that. They saw that. I got bub kissed. I was so mad. Mm. So then at the end of it, we go down and the last hour is you sit as a group and they tell you the history of the house. And then if people have pictures, digital pictures, you know, they, they verify and say, you know, blah, 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 blah. This is oh, good. Oh, that's that the old colonel. Good. This is yeah. the lady in and white. They have this whole thing about, you know, there was this old married couple that the husband lived on the bottom floor and the woman lived on the top floor and they hated each other and they shouted each other all the time. The bathroom's got a particularly nasty dude. Like they had, they knew all these people and the history of this house, it had been a brothel, a prison, um, an orphanage, uh, a drug den. Jesus. This one house. Over the 100, 150 years of it, had had so much psychic. This is like the house in it. So it was kind of, it's kind of, if you're not going to experience something in that house, you're just, you know, you're shit out of luck. So (laughs) I was really, so I thought, oh, well, damn it. I didn't get anything. You know, I filled up my thing. And you you didn't feel anything at all? I mean, I, yes, but that for me is normal. Right. It's a, you know, like I would walk into a room and I'd feel overwhelmed. What did you feel when you walked into this studio? So warm and wonderful. Aww. You're such a loving energy. I sense a darkness she's hiding beneath it. <laughs> I'm in so much pain. Help me. Oh, no. um, so, uh, and they, they uh, you know, they give you a, a card and it says, listen, if you check your devices, then uh, if you find anything, send it to us and we'll verify whether it's real or not. So I didn't even think about it. I was so depressed. <laughs> and I, a couple I days later. Why. I wonder <laughs> why. Exactly. So I pick out my digital recorder and I think, oh, I'll just listen to it. I'm sure the battery, you know, because the time I walked out, the batteries were dead and I assumed I'd gotten five minutes. Yeah. I had almost like 90 minutes. I don't know how it happened. And so I was really listening to it and mm. I, I captured two. I actually thought I felt I captured five. I sent all five to the to the group. So this is like later after the trip. You're going like, through the ninety minutes. I'm home. And go, yeah, I'm yeah, in New yeah, York. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm like, well, I'll just listen to it. And so I emailed the um, the EVPs to them, and they verified too. An EVP again stands for electronic, electronic voice phenomena. That's for people who don't know. And they what it, that is is that's a voice that most usually is not heard by the ear by the people in the room but um, electronic equipment is so sensitive it will pick it up and the, the interesting thing about it is that just remember my group was all women there was no men around mm-hmm. and um you can hear when we talk there's an acoustic ring our voices are in the space and bouncing off the space and the evp is very flat mm. it has no acoustic um, character. Mm. So these are the, interesting. Do you want to play both of them or one at a time? Yeah, um, you I tell. This is, you, which uh, one is this? Riley's um, at the board with the EVPs. You can um, and feel free to talk, Riley. Even though the camera doesn't pick you up or, or the camera, <laughs> the, he can't. I sent you two. One is um, I call it. Hey, you stop making noise, and just you can listen to it. You'll hear it. 
and then I'll tell you who it is. It's right near you. I'm it's right near her. <laughs> Hey there, stop making noise. I heard it. Whoa, it's really flat. It sounded like a man. Yeah, it is man. That's the husband that lives on the ground floor. And they literally, when I sent it to them, they were like, don't tell us where you were. Don't tell us anything about it. Let us listen to it. And they said, you were on the ground floor in this certain, in this corner. I was like, yeah. And they said, okay, that's, I don't remember his name, but they, were, and they gave me the whole history of this guy. Hey there, stop na- making noise. God, God, stop can, making can we noise. hear that one more time, man? I, that was amazing. Hey there, stop making noise. Remember, these are all women. He hates women, too. So he hated our group in particular. Voted for, tr- voted for Trump. Listen close. Whoa. And they do that on purpose, actually. They told us they make a group of women, all women, and a group of men, all men, because there are a particular entities mm-hmm. who hate the opposite gender or, really? yeah, or yeah, love yeah. the same gender. And so they do it on purpose because they always know the group of women, all women, is going to get that guy. Mm. Wow. And then the second one, this, um, well, it's just, it get, every time I listen to it, it gives me shivers. I'll, I'll, I'll just let you listen to it, and then we'll talk about it after. If you want us to leave this room, please cross the rods. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom. Hey, Thanks for that, Donna Wynn. <laughs> Every time I listen to it. Okay, so Great. who was asking the question? Who was the woman asking the that question? That wasn't me. There that was another woman. Yeah, yeah. yeah Goosebumps. Said, Riley's going yeah, Goosebumps. That, she I'm said, going goosebumps. Down she my, said, she said if, you want, if you want us to leave, please cross the rods. Which was our way of a, a yes or rods. Yeah, yes or no. Got it. So the cross was... And you just establish yes or no questions. And before you get into each room, you say yes, you know, no, or whatever. And then you kind of use that. As you go, but that and then they said, "Okay, that was taken in the that was in the bathroom. That guy's a particularly nasty can dude." We, can we do that one one more oh, time? Oh God, Riley? okay. Just uh, but he he also that's hates the bathroom women. one, huh? The guy he's a, a the murderer and a rapist, and he was probably thrilled that a bunch of ladies were in there. Wow. Yeah. Listen again. Oh God! That almost sounded like a woman to me, though, like an evil. I don't know. Laugh. They not me. I don't they, know. They, yeah. they, you know, they again. They were like, send us the EVP, send us the files. Do not tell us anything about it. Don't tell us where you were. Don't tell us what room Boy. you're in. And they came back and they were like, oh yeah, that's mm-hmm. blah blah blah. That sounded demonic. Yeah, to me. it that did sounds, not sound. That sounds right. almost like a malevolent spirit, not so much. But a you human. can just I see the. Empath not that I'm equating me. a woman's laugh no, with no, 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 the malevolent. No. But the yeah. empath in me uh, feels. It, it, yeah, I just feel wrong. I just feel so wrong when I hear. I just. And know. these are photos. Uh, Donna Lynn brought photos from the. I did. Uh, is this the the where you were? Is this the same? These aren't because my photos were for crap. I told you I oh, got yeah. I got nothing. I walked out of there thinking I got bub kiss, and then I ended up with these like class A EVPs. Oh wow! And then there's some photos here with orbs. And what we'll do is if you go to our Facebook page, we'll put all mm-hmm. of these up in in the episode. Yeah, uh, 11 this is photo my album. favorite. This is in the Queen Anne Hotel in San Francisco. I will. Of of course, in any city. It's a woman city. sitting in a hotel lobby. It's me. Oh, that's you. That's me. My mom took this picture. Oh, wow. Um, oh, yeah. There you are. And I... Um, there's a giant blue orb hovering over that's you. Now, here's the question. Orbs. Is it orbiting or is it sitting right next to me well, yeah. or on my lap? Now, now, orbs are directly connected to UFO phenomena as well as paranormal uh, ghost encounter I've, phenomena. I've caught, an or- I've caught orbs on film before at a haunted hotel in I, Orbs, Kansas. Yeah. You can see the tracer of the I've orb got one on video through camera photo to photo. Myself. Yeah from Halloween night. It's crazy. One of my favorite places is the Myrtle's Plantation. You guys probably know. You know about that? It's about two and a half hours out of NOLA. Mm -hmm. And um, I, of course, (laughs) stay there. Any place I can stay that's like certifiably haunted, I'll stay. Wow. And this place, this picture here, it looks like sort of a smoke ring. Um, it's a picture of a when courtyard. you guys are looking out in a courtyard, and there there are some very famous ghost photos from this plantation. The story is that um, one of the uh, slaves mm-hmm. at the time, um, I believe, tried to murder the master of the house and or something, and she got her ear cut off. And so it's a lot of aye, aye, aye. very, very strifey. 
You, you um, know, I just want to say, this is, you know, it's like so many people ask for, where's the evidence, you know? And it's like, here you go, Donalyn, <laughs> into the cavity, and you come out with evidence. And we get to look at it, and we get to hear it with our own voices, and we get to let our guts make an, uh, make a, a, an integral opinion about it. And some people and make yet, physical contact. And there's half well. of us that are going to listen to it, and then there's the other half of us that aren't and so but that's okay yeah like i think that's all right because those people who don't they will find something that that hopefully will make them a better and not a worse person and if living like that and if it's too much if it's too much for them to think yeah. that that the, there are things that exist outside the box then god I think bless people them, are just you know? afraid to feel foolish or sure. look foolish well it's also a loss of control you yeah. know i mean things like the bible and the quran you know they they're instruction manuals and if you read them in a certain way they they tell you what to do and they tell you black and white and they tell you this is right and that is wrong and that's a great comfort to a many many uh, so many people who perhaps might be afraid to not think for themselves me. <laughs> because when you think for yourself, you have to take responsibility Ooh. for yourself, and that's a terrifying prospect. You know? Oh yeah, it is. Um, oh boy! But you know, I, so I, I also find that people who are think more outside the box tend to be people. I mean, I don't want to generalize, but you know, it, it, tend to be people who aren't so afraid of what ifs. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll, and, you know, trying new experiences and, and thinking maybe accepting I'm wrong. different types of people. Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. I often tell this story. I think it was from a, an episode I did that UFOs in Topanga, one couple gets out and they're literally looking at it for minutes. There's another couple in the back that they see it, but they just won't address it. You know, they just say, what is that? So weird, right? I know. And then they just keep talking. They move on. Mm -hmm. They move right on. There so. was a Fascinating article, I, I think, by Ezra Klein in, in Vox just today, just talking oh, cool. about the political climate and how your your brain as well as your body will throw up a defense mechanism mm -hmm. and you will believe what you need to believe if it's big enough to crash your way of thinking. Well, yeah. you know, last episode I talked about the 1952 Washington invasion and, you know, this was at a political time. It's a UFO it's yeah. a, it's encounter. A, it's a UFO DC. encounter, but you talk about what's going on in, in current events and it was at such a time where there was so much turmoil, I think it parallels very closely to what we are feeling and what's happening very much today. And, yeah, you know, you Mike's even going to segue into well into his story later, okay. which kind of like... Picks up on the heels of that. It picks up right on the heels of the 52 Washington UFO Oh, I love it. Let's hear it. Yeah, we'll go right to it. We're going to... First of all, Donna Lynn, thank you. That, that was, was super goosebumps. fucking rad. I'm so excited. So yeah. cool. Yay. Hey there. I, what a keep treat. It down a little bit. Stop it. Hey there. So that would be noise. me, right? If I'm on a hot I'm, I'd be like... Like, can you guys stop? Can you guys not argue? <laughs> like, I don't stop. hate women. That I'm would just... be my ghost thing. Stop arguing. Stop in, arguing with your sister. But in, <laughs> in reality, though, that's probably for him, he's probably going, hey there, stop making noise. Right. You know, that's yeah. probably his reality. But by the time it gets through Crosses all the filters, through. it sounds very, hey there, stop making noise. Wow. We're going to okay. get back to that Oof. on what the hell was that. Well, yes. we're not going to stop making noise. We are going to take a quick break. And then yep. when we come back, it's time for our high strangeness story of oh, the week. Shakalaka. Hey guys, Bryce Johnson here. Each week we post exclusive photos with our guests and great visual aids on Instagram at Bigfoot Collectors Club and on Facebook and Twitter at Bigfoot underscore C Club. Check them out. You don't want to miss them. Thanks for listening. Okay, guys. So what, what it's a, time for high strangeness. Yeah. What were we gonna say? What I was a, gonna say. What a treat. That, I know. Those audio. We could quit. Were. We could end this episode now, and you've already got your totally. money's worth, oh which God. is nothing. We all have to go free. out for a drink yeah. though, because I have so oh. many stories. Like oh, that. Love great. it. What a treat for our listeners. So uh, last week uh, we had Danny Jollis as a guest, Danny. and uh, Bryce talked about the um, the flying saucer UFO activity that was happening. All throughout uh, the summer of 1952. The and summer of saucers, In particular, yeah. there was a big flap over the Washington, D.C. area. So we're talking about, you know, near Virginia, Maryland. And uh, today, we're going to talk about a story that happened in September of 1952 on the heels of one of the busiest UFO um, summers in, in American history. And at the time... Uh, 
UFOs are be- and flying saucers are becoming more and more popular in in pop culture and in science fiction and like uh, comic books and movies. And a lot of this has to do with the uh, fear of the Cold War and the upcoming war with Korea and fear of invasion. Except there's been a lot of actual eyewitness stuff happening. So this is the story of the Flatwoods Monster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> One of my all-time favorite uh, cryptids. Yeah. So uh, the Flatwood, it, this is a what we would call a close encounter involving the Flatwood mon- Flatwoods Monster, a.k.a. the Braxton County Monster, the Green Monster, and the Phantom of Flatwoods. Um, this took place in Flatwoods, West Virginia, on September 12, 1952. Now, this story, as I said, comes on the heels of, of last week's story of the 1952 UFO flap. And in the small town of Flatwoods, West Virginia, night was beginning to fall. This is a rural town. There are farms. There's, you know, there's probably a little um, Main Street area. But if if you look at photos of it and you do research, it's it's a rural town. Uh, And uh, it's in the dead center of of, uh, West Virginia. So Fred and uh, Eddie May, two schoolboys were playing football with their friends, Tommy Heyer and Ronnie Shever. And I think uh, these guys, these kids were all elementary school age. I think the youngest was six, and the eldest was maybe 11 or 12. Now, in the empty uh, schoolyard where they were playing, they looked up and saw a giant, almost pear-shaped, flaming red ball shoot overhead. And the boys watched as it arced, over the mountain range near the school, turned at a 45-degree angle, stopped, and then lowered behind uh, the trees. The boys freak out. And I love this story, too, because this reminds me of, like, playing outside with all my friends growing up in Kansas and, and like, oh, I would just wish something like this would happen. <laughs> totally. So all the boys go running and screaming to, the, to Kathleen May, Eddie, and Fred's mother. And she lived like across the street from the school. So this is all nearby. So they run inside and they go, some of the boys say it's a meteor. Some of the other boys say, nope, it's a flying saucer. Kathleen, being kind of a cool mom, she goes, all right, well, let's go take a look. And she grabs uh, Eugene Lemon, who's her cousin, who's an 18-year-old National Guard uh, guardsman. And his buddy, uh, I think Neil Numley is his name, Numby. Uh, let me just double check that. Yeah, Neil Numby. So this craft or this object had landed uh, at the Bailey Fisher Farm, which was near their house. So they all in a pack start walking up the dirt road through the farm. And uh, as they head up, they as they head up the the road, they have to eventually the from what I understand, the the dirt road ends, and then they have to cross through like a fence and then another fence to get to where the boys saw this object land. And as they're walking up the road, they're accompanied by Eugene's dog and a neighbor collie, and then uh, a, a neighbor collie. And then uh, in some of the reports, there was there was also a third dog. So there's about seven people and three dogs walking up the hill. Well, it's basically, hey, everybody, come check this out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So as they're walking up, they hear strange mechanical sounds. They start to hear weird sizzling noise. Uh, Kathleen went on later to say that it sounded like uh, like breakfast frying on the on the fryer on the stovetop, like bacon sizzling. And a uh, the dog, one of the dogs, uh, Eugene's dog, runs up ahead and disappears over the crest. Barks wildly and then comes running back to the group with his tail tucked under his leg. Now, a couple of the boys, the younger boys, stay behind at the fence as Kathleen and Eugene Lemon and uh, the, his other buddy and one of the other boys continue up. The dogs stay behind. Bryce would stay behind as yeah, well. Yeah, I would be like... Just to make sure everybody's okay <laughs> that didn't go and look. But as, <laughs> as this has been happening, also this strange mist, almost an exhaust, starts rolling down the hills. And the smell is really bad. And the this mist starts to burn their eyes and their noses and their throat. Uh, and it's and it's ir- irritating at first. It's not burning them alive, but it's bothering them. They're coughing. They're feeling nauseous. Now, off to the right, uh, they spot the craft in a field, and it's a glowing red 
uh, almost pear-shaped ball. And that's when up to the left, there's an oak tree and Eugene sees what he thinks are two raccoon eyes in, up in the tree. So he turns his flashlight on this thing and suddenly these eyes light up with the yellow lights and start beaming out at everybody. Kathleen said, the mother said, she was like 32, 34 at the time, she said that when they put their uh, flashlights on this thing, it lit up like a Christmas tree. Wow. What, like reflected the light? Well, or, oh, here's okay. the thing. Oh, okay. The object itself, the creature lit up. Oh, okay. Like a Christmas tree. Now, here's the thing, and we'll get into this. Uh-huh. Later, as the story spread, the Flatwoods monster was uh, depicted to be a flesh and blood creature. And I'll show you a photo. It almost looks like a uh, like a witch. And this is the photo that I saw when I was like, it's not a photo, it's a drawing, a composite uh, that I saw when I was a kid that freaked me out. Mm. But in actuality, <laughs> and, and one of the reasons it was drawn this way was they described it as having a round head like a helmet, a bright red round head with two glowing eyes that oh, yeah. were like portholes in a ship. Look okay? at that. That is... In addition to the round head, there was a helm shaped like an ace of spades on top of it. The strange being had no arms, but the witnesses described short claws or antennae sticking out from the side. The base of the creature was described as a cylindrical skirt or cone with pleats, as Kathy described, Kathleen described them, or they were pipes. It seemed mechanical, mm-hmm. and it was hovering like a rocket. Bo- like it, the bottom looked like a rocket booster and it was hovering towards yeah. them uh, and emitting this exhaust out of the skirt of the thing. So even though the first image looks like a flesh and blood, almost witchy creature, they think this thing was actually a mechanical suit, that there was a pilot inside of this thing or just a and, remote or a remote, remote possible possibly a remote thing but that the, 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 the eyes lit up the, what were the eyes were window holes portholes that there was a lit from within that shot out the light mm. and the was, body glowed green and that's why it was called the green monster it lit up green was this the pilot of that downed aircraft this is where we're going with this <laughs> so the monster let out a screeching hiss and f- levitated towards them and it started spewing black oil that got all over kathleen may's apron her dress her house dress and uh everyone freaks out starts screaming and they take off back down the hill with to find the rest of the group they get back to the house and the the, the boys and kathleen just start feeling sick and Lemon, Eugene Lemon, the National Guardsman, he starts throwing up. It's so bad. And later they said, uh, when they went and saw a physician in the next couple of days, and the physician said that they had symptoms that were very similar to that of victims of mustard gas. Mm. But they didn't see, uh, that was the last time they saw the creature. But she, Kathleen immediately called the sheriff. Now, this is, where, Bryce, you're going to love this. The sheriff and the deputy sheriff were already out investigating in a nearby part of uh, the county, a supposed eyewitness seeing a a, uh, crashed airplane going Mm. down. And what we're going to find out is all this night, there are over 21 reports of of flying saucers and meteors and crashing objects coming out of the sky all over uh, West Virginia, Virginia, um, Maryland, and Pennsylvania in that in that whole area, right? And this is coming on the heels of of this summer where all this stuff is going on. To give you a little context, Donna, I, I in in the last episode, you know, the the United States Air Force were playing cat and mouse with these UFOs in the summer of '52 even going so far as to be reported to have downed a few while they took down a few of ours as well. So there was a there was a little airborne dogfight taking place over the skies of the East Coast in that summer of 52. So, oh, and supposedly know. someone called in the sheriff and said, I think I just saw a plane go down. Something crashed, went down right. near nearby. So they're off. They're in the same county. They're in Braxton County, but they're off in another, in another nearby town. And, you know, again, it's rural, so the police department is very uh, small. The sheriff's department, the county sheriff's department, department so they decide i think a state trooper actually because there's all this other activity going on that night these calls the state trooper actually this would never happen today they send out a reporter from one of the local papers that's right uh (laughs) a lee stewart 
to go over because he had he was a mil- former military guy and he was a photojournalist and they trusted him they knew him and they were like go talk to this family and see if you can find out what's going on so a lee stewart goes over there interviews the family he sees that they are all distressed and all freaked out he's like okay well take me back up there and he talks Kath- kathleen into walking him back up to the site Shit. and he claims to have found uh oily substance all over and two uh, like heavy tracks that some people think had been from a truck that also drove up there from a local guy's last name was like Lockheed, Lockhart or something. Yeah. But um, later findings, uh, arguments were like, well, the 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 the, the um, birth of the tracks weren't were too wide or too deep for what a truck would make up there. Anyway, um, and so Stewart went up there, checked it out. He smelled and, the gas. Yeah, too. he smelled the gas. He smelled the exhaust too. He he said that the the smell was really foul and really really bad up there. Now, as this is going on, U.S. Air Force contacted Captain Dale Levitt, a National Guard commander, to come up and expect, inspect the site that night too. Yep. Um, and I think everyone's a little on high alert because there's all this activity going on. This is night. military personnel right. getting a phone call. And they're calling. And again, you know it's rural because the U.S. Air Force goes, we got to call the National Guard's captain because we don't have anybody out there nearby. And they may have been dealing with something else. Mm-hmm. So uh, Dale Levitt, this captain, he goes up um, and he had already, he too had had been in, trying to investigate the area of the plane crash and they found nothing. He and the sheriff's department found nothing over there. So then when they got a call that there was some other thing that landed, he brings 50 or 60 guys over there to the to the site behind up on the on the Fisher farm, the Bailey Fisher farm with six, 50, 60 men and took samples. And they saw, according to them, they found a six meter wide depression of where the boys had seen this object sitting in the in the field. He collected samples and sent them to the Air Force, and they supposedly never got back to him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because he's national, he's not part of the you know main Air Force. That same night, a local uh, educator that I think was in, he was like one of the district school guys, supervisor or superintendent. Uh, he had called in the next morning after the reports came out. He had seen a craft just like that, a red glowing orbish pear-shaped thing take off from his woods nearby at 6.35 in the morning. So they think that this craft may have landed originally on the Bailey Fisher, Fisher Farm. They had come up and then it had taken off again by the time they got back and was sort of taking off and landing all around the area. Yeah. Possibly... To because it needed to make an emergency landing for repairs. That's what this I. This is yeah. where our friend, uh, our friend Frank uh, Fascino Jr., who wrote a book that I read years ago called "The Braxton County Monster." He's the expert when it comes to this story, and he has spent years, decades, interviewing the witnesses, interviewing, uh, uh, ch- researching all the stuff that was going on that night. And his whole book is connecting the dots between this incident and everything that was going on in the summer of 1952. Wow. He thinks that there was an aerial battle happening around that area, and some of our, the U.S. Air Force shot down, uh, shot down this craft, and that this creature was actually a suit with a pilot inside of it. Now, you ask, why wasn't it not just a robot? Well, because Frank found another witness from September 13th, the next night. Uh, uh, on the 13th, a couple, George and Edith uh, Snitowski, were driving with their ba- baby in nearby Frametown when their car suddenly stopped working. Classic UFO encounter. The, the, the car just stops. Uh, Frank gets out, checks the hood, checks the battery, can't find anything wrong with it. And he suddenly sees a light coming from the woods nearby. He gets out his flashlight, starts investigating, and here comes that exhaust rolling out of the woods. Mm. And he starts coughing and sneezing. His wife, Edith, watches this from their car as their baby's crying. And out of the woods uh, comes a creature that uh, Frank described as from the waist down looking like a a jet engine, a cylindrical cone or jet engine with pipes that shot out exhaust and levitated. Right. But from the waist up, instead of the glowing green hole and the little antennae and the red uh, face and spade helmet, it was a reptilian creature. Right. From the waist up. Oh, that's, they think it was the yeah. pilot, and he had taken off the spacesuit, essentially, but was still levitating around in this thing. Mm-hmm. 
Edith starts screaming. Frank makes it back into the car and shuts the door, and they watch as this creature hovers around their cars. They're coughing with this, like, exhaust and this bad smell. And they say that he reached out his hand that had two, only two long reptilian fingers, placed his hand on the hood of the car, and what? burnt the primer off of the car. <sighs> And then he slowly went back out into the woods and the mist evaporated. And uh, after a few moments, the car started back up and they they took off. Wow. Um, also on the 13th, that same day, previously that same day, Kathleen May was visited on her front doorstep by two men in suits mm. asking her about the report because it had gone to the press by this point. Somebody cared. Yep. So they, too, asked her to take her take them up the hill where they saw this creature. She leads them up there, and in like a good Men in Black story, I th- she said they were wearing fine suits. I don't know if they were black. One of them was behaving a little weird. He wandered into the woods and came back out, according to her, covered in uh, that black oily substance that she was sprayed with. They also scraped the samples off of her dress and took them with, took them with her, uh, took, took it with them. And she never heard from them again. And when Frank Ficino, I think it was him or it was another investigator asked her whatever happened to that dress. She was like, well, it was a long time ago. You know, that was a long time, you know? So Mm -hmm. she didn't really think to save it in her mind. And she had, uh, she maybe kept it away and then lost it in the, uh, you know, in the decades that followed. Well, as if the corroborating witness evidence wasn't enough. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the story caught wind and accounts of the creature became exaggerated. Uh, the illustration accompanying the story featured a monster of more traditional flesh and blood variety that I showed you. Uh, but here's really, and again, we'll put this up on our Facebook. Here are some illustrations that Frank uh, Ficino Jr. did based on the eyewitness accounts of what this creature actually looked like. Do you know like what's... a dialect. Yeah. yeah, it does. It looks like a Dalek. It looks like a Dalek. Yeah, Dalek with the face. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's so amazing. Man. And here are the boys and their drawing of it. And then this is a more modern rendition, re- computer render of what this thing might have looked like. Uh. I mean, and it so fits the times, right? The yeah. mustard gas, yep. the old, like, uh, the old bottom propel thruster, like with the pipes, it's yep. so weird. Yep. With yep. the one it's so sort of weird. From the this front, this, one this, this literally out. is high strangeness. You see, so this is why I move towards the interdimensional Me theory, too. So, and because we are playing an active role in what we see. Right, right. So, right. So, Ivan Sanderson, who was an anomalist and a writer, investigated this story and thought that the creature. He was the first one to suggest that the creature was an extraterrestrial in a mechanical suit, and that planted the seed for the book that Frank Ficino Jr. went on to write. Now, Fashino thinks the Air Force shot it down and the alien was making an emergency landing for repairs. Wow. These pictures are amazing. Yeah. I can't wait for And if you, you go to, to Flatwoods it. today, there's a sign that says Home of the Green Monster. They have, <laughs> they, it's become a mascot there. It's become this really famous story. But there's like a lot of these cryptids, there are a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of disinformation out about there. Well, and hopefully, I'm not spreading more. But this is the be- this is this is the version of the story that I could collect. Let's assume that it's real. Hold on. Oh, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna get to oh, that, is that right the away. Next part? Oh, you're gonna that's love the it. Flatwoods okay. monster. You're gonna figure it all out. And I when just, we come no, back, we're gonna ask you what the hell was that? <laughs> oh, copy, copy that. Let's do it. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Bryce Johnson from Bigfoot Collectors Club. Listen, if you have a paranormal story, we want to hear it. Write to BigfootCollectorsClub at gmail.com with your paranormal encounter, and we just might read it on a future episode. Okay, Donna Lynn, Flatwoods Monster, what the, what hell? the hell was that? Ah! I believe it. I think it was an alien. That makes 100% sense to me. Now, here's where here's my question to the group and to everyone out there. So, let's let's uh, let's just say that it's an alien, okay? Mm. And then for whatever reason in a suit, not in a suit, whatever, crash land. The alien is there for a reason. Now, we can assume from your podcast last week that it was there was some sort of military battle going on. Now, they, they were very upset that we were working on rocket-guided radar-controlled missiles. Now, here's my question. If you look at the history of, of the world, like back to the Egyptians, back to Atlantis, back to, you know, there seems the dinosaurs, there seems to be some sort of reset that happened. This has always fascinated mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. Is you know, there's civilization, and then there's not, mm-hmm. and then there's Noah's Ark, and the, like, or you know, you can find it in the cultural myths. Now, my this is one of my big things about aliens is I'm wondering, are we getting reset 
from the outside. And we reach a point where someone out there decides that humanity has, can I swear on this? Yeah. Has fucked up once again and is beyond repairing. And then they reboot us and then we start all over. And I wonder, so, or do they need some sort of mineral that Earth has? And, you know, but I think it's, I think it's a bigger picture. Yeah. I don't think you're too far off. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I was just gonna say, uh, oh my! <laughs> Look on your face. I, yeah, no, I got a blank face, he, and I you I, got every so episode, excited. I every now and then, train of there's thought. just a face of. I'm so proud. No, but I could tell you were like excited too. Yeah, no, I I, I think you're absolutely onto it. I mean, um, listen, this is why. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. I forgot what I was going to say. Well, it's easy no, to, you have reset, to lower. Resetting. Yeah. If somebody's going to battle you, that kind of puts you on the, them on the same level as you because you, you're battling and for something equal. But if you consider that aliens are a more advanced I, race. I do remember what I was going to say that else. a lot of these reports that I read and especially some of the best ufologists in the field like Jacques Vallée. They like to believe that there's a certain intelligence at play here. Exactly. And whatever that means to that certain person, that a certain intelligence at play, playing with us, moving us socially, moving us to different parameters. Trying. So, yeah, it, it, trying it, uh, anyway, exactly. They're more so, advanced, obviously, just because they can travel. Well, you know, but no, <laughs> let me add, to add to that point, we here, now here's where it gets weird, right? Where they're so much more advanced, but yet this thing speaks Builds out mustard gas, and yet this and thing oil. is this thing needs a spacesuit that looks like it came out of a '60s science fiction or did pulp it though? Fiction. This is people's perception with the with the vocabulary and the knowledge that they have at the time. So this what, plays a part. What they know is mustard gas. What they know is oil. That yeah. doesn't mean that's what it was. I mean, we've seen all the alien shows where like there are paintings from the 1400s well, right. where it's like, oh my god, that's an alien. Yeah, yeah. but they look at it as an angel or, or right. somebody flying like a chariot. That looks like you know back in old like. Centuries ago, their depictions were like you know these yeah. aliens. Fly. So but the question is, maybe they looked like that. The question but they is, weren't. the question is, are we perceiving them? It, uh, is our brain perceiving something that we can't fathom? Yes, and and literally projecting our own modern uh, technology onto it in yes. order to understand it, or or. Are we just using the best language we have to describe what we saw? Both. I, I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Listen, everything we see in report when it comes to this parano paranormal stuff is always about 10 years ahead of us, 15 years ahead of us. The ghosts, why do they always look like uh, old old days? And nowadays, where are they? And, and do they still look like they're from the old days? Like, why do our aliens change? Why do our UFOs change, you know? Well, just they're, look at technology. Yeah. There's been a lot of sudden bursts in technology. Well, they I'm say it doubles every two of, years, you know? Very suspicious of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to think that if they're visiting us, it's more of a um, – they're they're less interested in interacting with us, and that's why uh, people go, well, why why haven't they landed? It's it, because – Why would they, they need to? Well, A, they, ha they probably have, but it might be like we're a flock of wild flamingos and a scientist walks in – the, does a flamingo know what a, sci a human scientist is? No. Do they care? Some of them probably don't. Some are probably do very. They, and do also, they make different races deals? as well. Yeah, that's what different I'm saying. Different races of aliens. Well, right, I'm but, sure but, but I, I'm, different... I'm just using this as yeah. an analogy because we might be a, pa a, a flock of flamingos to them. And, and what do they need? What do scientists need from flamingos? What do zoologists need? That's always my question. The, 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 well, Why? Yeah, what do they need? Well, they're just studying them. They're trying to figure out how they work. Do they care? Some someone would argue they do care what happens to the to a flamingo species. And you know, I you know so there might be some preservation taking place, there might be some tagging and studying, there might be abducting and dissecting. Or or they, they might, might not give a fuck. They might have been here long before we yeah. were. They might be in our oceans. There's yes. I mean, have you guys covered the snake people yet? No. Okay. Well, there's that whole theory of there are snake there are aliens. The reptilians. The reptilians. Yeah. Live Living on the earth, they've been yeah, here waiting the, for in us. The underground. Have you heard those? Earth. Have you heard those interviews of the of the one reptilian who sort of came forward and had all these interviews? Who knows if it's real? But yeah. God, I love it. Um, <laughs> there's a really fascinating exchange which chilled me, and uh, but it was it, it made sense to me in the alien thing, where they were like, "Look, we're deep inside the earth. 
you don't bother us, we don't bother you. You come into our area, we'll fry your brain. But otherwise, you know, we were here first. We're just going to hang out here. But then the the human interacting said, well, what will you do if, like, we ruin the earth? Right. And they kind of go, you know, that what, what will you do? And they were like, you are of no consequence to us. You are. Do you as humans think of the ants? You, you this don't. This is my point. We, I just said flamingos. But, but, but yeah, so I, jumping, continuing that thought, they don't necessarily have to come from away. New musical on Broadway, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. They um, can already be here. Right. And be kind of popping out, and maybe they have scout missions or whatever. But I mean, I have, I'm a firm believer that there, we already have alien well, life in, in the ocean. In that case, it would make sense that. And in the caves. And by, the, you know. And then it makes already. sense that. You know, not too long after the invention of the airplane, we start seeing more of these things because mm-hmm. we're, we're up, up in the sky now. We're looking up. Yeah. If we would only just uh, study our own planet as much as we would the moon and Mars, I think we <laughs> I know. might be off to a good start. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> well, that was uh, – uh, thank you for dissecting that, Donna Lynn. Oh, my uh, we God. Could, so this, much fun. This could keep going. I swear to God I could be here for like eight I hours. We, and we, we <laughs> could not too. Blink. Unfortunately, Riley has a life to get back to. Uh, yeah, when it. we when we come back, we're going to we're gonna uh, ask about your... – What the hell was that? No, we already did that. Oh, right. Time Warp. Time warp. We're going to... Collector's Club. Yeah, it's Collector's Club time. Something you'll love. Okay, cool. Hey, guys. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Bigfoot Collector's Club and on Twitter at Bigfoot underscore C Club. Okay, so uh, this is a clubhouse first. We did this whole... we, We just had this whole spooky conversation. We recorded our Collector's Corner... And Riley, our sound engineer, you're about to hear him for the first time because what happened? Um, I, well, I pushed stop, and then all of a sudden, I I had watched the whole thing record the whole time. It was all there. I pushed stop, and the file just vanished. It was gone from the computer, and all that was left was a tiny clip of the end of the segment that we'd recorded. I've never had that happen. And that segment the says, segment where you go, guys, that was so fun. And then it played back over speaker. So fun. It also did echo her right back afterwards. This is a really one of the stranger things. <laughs> okay. I, I need to ask you a question as, yeah. as the resident witch. Is this place bound? Uh, I don't know what that means. Have you cleansed it like the stage and then bound it with, you know, ritual? I have not, but maybe you could help me I out with I think I need to come back. <laughs> <laughs> she brought something on purpose so no, she could come back. No, but here's the thing. You talk about this stuff, you open, not like necessarily portals, but you do, when you have these discussions, it sort of is good to sort of like do a very quick cleansing protective circle, which we didn't do. <laughs> well, I just always because treat every subject with in. tremendous respectability and that's and that's my shield. And this may not we we assume because it's odd that it's malevolent, but it might very well just be some energy that came in that's very positive that was like, hey, what's up? Oh, I shorted it. Get out. Yeah. Leave yeah. while you can. Well yeah. I'm I, sorry guys. Bye. I know what you mean because if it was malevolent, it would have like fried the whole thing. It, yeah. it was like one little five minute. And now thing we've got Riley on, on mic, which and is actually, nice. The what clip, a voice. The clip it left was the was the phrase so fun yeah yeah Yeah. oh boy anyway so so why don't you guys do your uh collector's corner one more time for the first time yes so again mr michael jeez this is where (laughs) being experienced actors come in uh that that was spooky that was really really weird because we heard it just as we were saying goodbye Donalyn said, like, oh, that was, was so, so fun. fun. And then over the speakers, there came a, the clip me of saying, me. No, me. Oh, was it, it was you? me saying, oh, so, fun, so fun, echoing you. Oh, my and Lord. And that's the only thing that survived. So, uh, Bryce, you brought something for the Collector's Club today, didn't you? I did. We've absolutely. already, we're going to pretend we haven't seen it and yet. And you know what? But... I'm so glad I get to do this again because I forgot out to shout out the guy who gave this to me. So, a good friend of mine, an excellent science fiction writer and director named Mike Bates, as a gift, gave me. Um, Ray Parker Jr.'s opus, Ghostbusters, the 30th anniversary glow-in-the-dark 10-inch LP. Um, It was something I treasure to this day. (laughs) And I was saying, I was like, I either owned this or I really wanted it or like my brother had it because I'm looking at it and I have a very like tangible connection to it. I either stood in the record store and looked at it for a very, very long time, or I, I my brother had it and I One coveted. of the first <laughs> like performances I ever did was for my third grade class. My teacher made me get up and sing the Ghostbusters theme song for everybody. Who did? Oh my, gosh. my third grade teacher. Why? The, she liked me. She was like one of the only elementary school teachers that liked me. <laughs> okay, but seriously though. Mine was wild how did thing it go to over? Great. They <laughs> loved it. I mean, I did, had, were you a smash? Were you just a huge Yeah. Deal? I mean, I was still a dork, but 
it, I entertain the people. I got you some did. applause. You had, <laughs> so yeah. Donna Lynn, what? what do you collect? Um, well, you know, being of, of the witchy persuasion, um, I do have things that I collect. I have, um, I love keys. Um, the like janitor keys. No. <laughs> Yeah, they just make me feel important. <laughs> like everyone trusts me. No, uh, the, the old fashioned skeleton keys. Yeah. There's just something artistic. Like you find and romantic in a little graveyard or an old Victorian house. Right. Or old jewelry boxes. They don't yeah. have to be big. They can be, you know, the little ones. I just love the shape of it. I just find it very beautiful and full of, um, full of magic. Yeah. And uh, uh, stones, um, just because, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that they do have genuine. Um, Properties, healing, protection. Um, so I have a lot of gemstones. Um, and then... Uh, you were telling us something really oh, cards. cool about cards. Yeah. Okay, so I'm a... I'm a tarologist above other things. Uh, tarot tar- tarot is the thing that I get the most. Like when I studied with Judy, we kind of... I, I kind of had a nice sort of like, well, what about astrology? Well, what about runes? Well, what about, you know, this or that? The neurology and um, reflexology. And the, the tarot cards were my thing. Um, and so for about a two to three year period, while I was sort of embracing the cards and learning about the cards and kind of opening up myself, I, in New York city, I would find not necessarily, not, not always tarot cards, but like just regular playing cards, which of course, if you read tarot, you can, you can do a reading for somebody from a plain deck of cards. You just have to have the knowledge of what it all means. But I would find like about 10 cards in a row. Um, just on the sidewalk. On the sidewalk. And everybody just everybody else, like, walking by them as if they are not there. And they're there. playing cards or tarot cards? Well, one time, most of the time was playing cards. Okay. Um, but one time, and then I would I would take, I would pick them up in order, like breadcrumbs. Uh-huh. And I would pick them up, and 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 nor- usually they were wet. <laughs> it was either <laughs> snow or rain. It was always like, hilarious. Thanks, universe. Right. And I would, they would stick together, <laughs> and I would put them in my pocket, and then I'd go home, and I'd. Put the laid them out in order as a reading, and I would write it down, and it would I, it would always be applicable, which was crazy. And another time, it was actual tarot cards that were my deck. I, I used the writer deck, mm-hmm. um, which is a very um, that's the old school. That's kind when of you think like of tarot base, cards, yeah, that's you picture yes. the writer deck. And um, I've always wanted to find another. Well, I haven't wanted to because I haven't gotten another deck, but I've always been open to it. But I've I've had the same deck for like twenty five wow. years, um, and. Uh, Another time, it led me straight to a music shop. I was uh, I was looking for an instrument. I couldn't find it anywhere, and I I went to the end of it and I looked up and it was like, oh, I should maybe just look in here. And there it was. I found the thing. You I was literally for. followed a trail of cards to it's crazy an antique music store. Well, Judy, my teacher, she kind of opened me up to that because her teacher apparently left dimes. Wow. Whenever you found a dime, uh, you she knew that her teacher was trying to communicate right. or, and and um I was like oh that's cool I wonder what my thing is and like literally a month later these cards started to appear and it hasn't happened so much I, lately I once uh saved a uh, a hummingbird's life that I found on a sidewalk <gasps> and through the help of my sister uh who gave me instructions on mixing uh sugar water I brought this little thing back to, like, he drank from my hand. He was, like, on death's door. That's amazing. And I, like, sat with him for, like, 30, 40 minutes until he suddenly, like, he went from being a little, like, clump to, like, he did this thing where he just stretched his a wings Phoenix and suddenly rising. looked like a butterfly totally. and took off. And I swear to God, ever since that time. Now, my neighborhood has hummingbirds. Mm-hmm. But I'll be walking down the sidewalk, and a hummingbird will fly right up into my face, hover, and then take off, as oh, if to that's say. Your totem. And they've started now. I'm like, see them everywhere. Yeah. Weird, right? Do you make connections to? Do you go further with that and try to figure out why, or do you just a sort little, of enjoy? Little, it? I, I enjoy it, but I kind of, I, I'm kind of like, oh, they know I'm a friend. Mm. <laughs> Also, Over the Rainbow, whenever I hear Over the Rainbow, somebody singing it on the radio and a commercial or whatever, for me, it makes me, um, it, it gets my attention. And I start to look and just sort of right. see, why wake, am wake, I supposed to look right. at this a little oh, more Oh, like a little cue, like, hey, hey, yeah, something's going to happen. There's really also cool. that great series of Conversations with God. Have you guys ever seen yeah, those Yeah, it's a books? great series. Where it kind of wakes you up to like, no, you hearing that song at that time on yeah. the radio 
it's not an accident. Yeah. Well, listen, I would challenge our audience members to be open to stuff and look up in the sky Magical more than you thinking. do. Totally. And you, uh, you'd be amazed what you see up yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, Donna Lynn, before we go, you're on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. I am. I'm you're, in uh, Downsizing. Which is out now. Which is out now. The new Alexander Payne. And Incredible. where can people find you? Uh, what, what's Twitter, your Twitter? Twitter, I'm at DL Champlin. And you're on Instagram, but you I, don't I really do I'm it. I am horrible at it's it. Okay. Somebody's got to... Will you give me a tutorial? Do you sure. understand Instagram? Yes, of course. All right. Yeah. We're on uh, Instagram as well, Bigfoot Collectors Club. Find us. Uh, Bryce, anything you want to plug? Definitely want to shout out the audience, and thank you guys so much for listening. Dude. I've been getting good feedback from friends and family. I and love watching. Just no, so it grateful. sounds creepy, like I'm on my tower on high, but I'm, <laughs> yeah, I can literally watch the audience grow on our website, so on the exciting. Podbean thing, and it's really, really cool. So thank you so much for Seriously, listening, Seriously, really appreciate it. We're Rate so us, review happy us. Yep. that you guys are listening and tuning in. I have a random question. Yeah. Do you need to be like on iTunes to listen to your podcast or you can Great listen question. to it everywhere? Because yeah. I remember looking for it and okay. I, ha- I was a little we're confused. On all platforms. We're on Podbean. We're on iTunes. Okay. We're on Stitcher and we are on Google Play. So you can listen to us on off your podcast app. on I- It's your oh, podcast app on your iPhone, not right. iTunes. If you're on your laptop, you can go directly to iTunes app and listen to us there. But on Got your phone, it. it's your podcast app. I'll show, you, I'll, I'll show you how to do it. Okay. Yep, and then we'll if you up. have the Stitcher app or Podbean app or Google Play app, you can listen to us there. We're basically now anywhere uh, podcasts can be found. So please rate, review, subscribe. We, it'll help us get the word out. And we know you guys are a big community because you're already reaching out. Tell your friends who are in all this stuff about the show. We would uh, love to hear from everybody. Yay. That's it. Cool. Riley, do we got this? Should we say it? Just He's for shrugging. Time? He's like, I Mike, don't know. You guys, it was so no fun. fun. <laughs> 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 no, 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 that's the one.